Kujo Kyoya is all dressed up for his very first day at the academy. As he walks out towards the entrance, he's concerned about looking strange and standing out, and he's curious about all the others who might be new freshmen. In his bag, he's got a talking cat named Felice, who he instructs to stay quiet, but she doesn't seem like one to follow rules. Kyoya pleads with her to stay inside the bag, fearing people will think he's odd if they catch him with a cat. Felice, on the other hand, complains that he's always worried about what people think of him, but Kyoya says it's because he hasn't met many people besides her for a long time. Felice disagrees, saying it's only been three years, but he insists that's just in the real world. Despite his struggles, Felice manages to escape the bag, and in the process, a girl walking behind them sees her. The girl gets super excited seeing the cat and quickly approaches them. She compliments how cute Felice is, and Kyoya inquires if she is a returnee like him. She confirms this and introduces herself as Imari Komari, a freshman. She mentions having an invitation letter and tries to show it to him, but she struggles to find where she kept it, causing a bit of panic as she searches around. After a frantic search, she finally finds it and shows him. It turns out she has the same invitation from the academy, just like Kyoya. The school bell suddenly rings, signaling that the entrance ceremony is about to begin. She rushes off, urging him to join her so they won't be late. As they leave, Kyoya cautions Felice to not let her guard down, because if their true identities are discovered, it's game over for both of them. At the entrance ceremony, the Prime Minister starts his speech, briefly touching on the school's history. He and Felice notice that the other students aren't really paying attention to the Prime Minister's speech. They're more engrossed in other things. Felice tells Kyoya that the people at the ceremony can essentially bring a kingdom to its knees, and to them, the government is insignificant. While the minister continues to speak, a lady interrupts, urging him to wrap up because everyone is bored and no one is listening. He decides to end his speech and hands the podium over to the lady. She introduces herself as Minaho Kuzuha, the academy's executive officer, and explains that the school is now a quarantine facility for everyone present. This step is necessary because as a country, they can't let the students run free. However, she assures them that they won't be locked up against their will. She goes on to explain that they can return to their normal lives with one condition. Their memories and abilities will be locked away. She acknowledges that not everyone might like that, as they wouldn't willingly let go of the talents they've gained. She understands their concerns, which is why the Academy wants to make a deal with them. As she tries to describe it as a safe experiment, a student interrupts, urging her to be brief. She promises to get to the point and snaps her fingers. Suddenly, a mystical rune appears on the ceiling, and to Kyoya's surprise, frightening monsters start emerging from it. When the monster appears, it terrifies the minister's men, who quickly flee, shouting for everyone to run. On the other hand, the students seem excited about the situation, swiftly grabbing their weapons to confront the monsters. Kyoya stands there, amused by the returnee's strength. In no time at all, they effortlessly defeat all of the monsters, earning Kuzuha's applause. She praises this year's freshmen for their energy, the students wonder if she is testing them, but she clarifies that she just gave them a challenge. She mentions it's been a while since they used their strength to overcome a threat, and asks if they felt good doing it. Finally, she unveils the Academy's offer and their mission to save the world once more. She explains that their world is a branch from a massive tree known as the World Tree, bearing countless other world fruits. Many of these worlds are in trouble because demons are devouring them. She goes on to explain that they require heroes to venture out and eliminate these pests. She then shares the story of a demon lord who is so ruthless and potent that it not only ravaged its own world, but also spread destruction to others. The goddesses only realized the scope of the disaster after this demon lord had already consumed thousands of worlds. Eventually, they managed to seal the demon lord and their world away, earning it the name, the Lost Demon Lord of the Lost World. She stresses that it's their duty to stop such a grave threat before it becomes insurmountable. She concludes her speech by comparing the school to a company that dispatches heroes. Once she finishes her speech, she announces that the next activity is the agility measurement. She then calls out a few names, including Kyoya and Komari, instructing them to follow her. The remaining heroes who weren't called are directed to proceed with the agility test. Later, the 13 students whose names were called join Kuzuha in another hall, where she surprises them by saying they don't need to take the test and should return to their dormitory. This prompts one of the students, Kishima Takeru, to inquire about her intentions. To explain, she rolls up her shirt's right sleeve, revealing a crest, and asks the heroes if they recognize what it means. She explains it's known as the Savior's Crest, a mark bestowed by the goddess as proof of saving the world. Then she inquires if any of them bear this crest on their arm. She scolds them, stating that they don't, since none of them were reported as clearers. It's either they didn't defeat the Demon Lord, were deported, or were summoned as a team but didn't fight. She labels them as dropout heroes and continues to make fun of them. This angers Takeru, 
who doesn't appreciate being called a dropout hero. He attempts to confront Kuzuha, and Komari tries to intervene, but is pushed to the ground. Kyoya rushes to check on Komari, and Takeru redirects his attention to him, demanding he stay out of it. Takeru offers an excuse for not completing his quest, blaming the world he was summoned to as a level 5 stage, claiming he was close to victory but got careless. He boasts about his raw power, asserting that he's stronger than anyone else. To prove it, he attempts to unleash Hellfire magic and threaten everyone with it, but in an instant his sigil is cut off, deactivating his magic before he can use it. Rei, the sword wielder, swiftly places her blade at his neck, mentioning a point deduction for breaking the rules. Kuzuha intervenes, saying there's no need for deductions as they haven't formed groups yet. The girl sheaths her sword and blames Kuzuha for being too lenient. Kuzuha makes fun of Takeru further and informs the other students they've all failed and don't even qualify as saviors. After that, Rei and Kuzuha stroll through the corridors, discussing how Takeru's spell had already been cancelled out and the fire's power was neatly erased before her sword struck. They both ponder who might have done it. Kyoya steps into his dorm room admiring its comfort, though he acknowledges that it's a world apart from the rooms granted to the other heroes with crests. Still, he finds his assigned room cozy. Felice eventually emerges from his bag, cautioning him that he was too obvious in neutralizing Takedu's spell, and the other two instructors might have noticed. Kyoya apologizes for his impatience. Both of them worry about Felice getting caught by the instructors. Felice asks Kyoya if he would protect her in such a situation, and he assures her he would. Surprisingly, Felice transforms into a beautiful lady, revealing herself to be the lost demon, who had lost her powers but managed to regain some. She attempts to seduce Kyoya, but he rejects her advances. Later, she recalls their meeting 3,000 years ago in another world, which is the equivalent to just three years ago in the real world. It turns out that after he was summoned to Felice's world, he had fought her, but couldn't bring himself to kill her. Let's zip back three years in time. Kyoya awakens in a strange, barren place with no memory of how he arrived. The sole living presence he spots is a woman standing over him, urging him to end her life. She helps him stand and suggests they have a chat. She reveals they're in the lost world. Kyoya inquires about her identity, and she introduces herself as Feriolus Fio Nyshurg, but prefers to be called Felice. She explains that the lost world is a desolate place where everything has met its end, leaving only vast wastelands. Kyoya wonders why it came to this, and she discloses that she's the reason, being a demon lord. He questions why a demon lord like her would want him, and she clarifies that she needs him to end her life. She tells him that she can't do it on her own due to her roots holding her back. She snaps her fingers, revealing the symbol of his spiritual core, and then shows him hers. She explains that her soul was specifically created to be a demon lord, which comes with many limitations, including not being able to end her own life. This is why she needs assistance. He worries about his lack of fighting ability, but she promises to personally train him until he can defeat her. She takes him to her treasury, a room filled with treasures from 3,000 worlds that she's conquered. She assures him that he will find everything he needs in there, and that she will use all of it to train him until he becomes strong enough to challenge her. She rummages through her collection, revealing some impressive items that could assist him in a battle. However, he is too stunned to respond. As Kyoya explores the treasury, his attention is drawn to an ordinary-looking sword. He's puzzled by its simplicity compared to the other treasures. Curiosity gets the best of him, and he reaches out to touch it. Suddenly, Felice materializes behind him and urgently warns him to not make contact. She explains that the sword is a living demon sword from an ancient branch of Calamity, known as Lavenquin. This blade devours people's souls, and since he isn't strong enough to wield it, even touching it would be fatal. However, she reassures him that in 300,000 years, he should be capable of mastering it. Kyoya is startled by her words, but she reassures him, explaining that time in the Lost World is only about one ten thousandth of the time in his world. She promises to train him thoroughly, revive him each time he dies, and restore his sanity if he goes astray. That night, Felice throws a welcoming party for him, and the next morning, Kyoya starts his training. His initial task is simple, walking a straight white line without deviating. However, subsequent tasks, though appearing easy, prove tougher than expected. Felice points out that humans often struggle to move their bodies precisely as they wish, so Kyoya first needs to enhance his body's ability to respond accurately to his will. She promises to ensure he understands how to use his body correctly. After 50 years, Kyoya's body begins to move gradually as he envisions. He starts doing more demanding activities like running and swinging. At the 100 year mark, his body is finally well conditioned, but the objective isn't just training, it's precise control as he envisions. It takes him 10,000 years before he can develop the magic power needed to use magic. At 20,000 years old, Kyoya becomes skilled in both magic and swordsmanship, spending his days battling demons created by Felice. 
In his remaining years, his training intensifies. In the lost world where entertainment is scarce, Kyoya finds happiness in conversations with Felice. They mainly discuss manga and things from home and school. Felice always listens no matter how dull the stories may seem. One story that Felice truly enjoys out of all of his stories is the tale of Kyoya's cat. This cat never pays any attention to what he says, but it's like family to him. On a particular occasion, Kyoya discovers the skeleton of a human, and curiously asks Felice why she destroyed those worlds. She explains that she did it because she was created that way, and now exists as a glitch that emerged after the job was done. By the time she gained self-awareness, everything was already in ruins. It is said that it's not her fault, but rather the fault of those who made her that way. However, she pretends to not have any empathy left for humans. He accuses her of lying, and she responds that she can't even distinguish truth from lies anymore. The only certainty she has is her weariness of the never-ending confinement she's trapped in. She advises him to get rest and get ready for combat training the following day. As she departs, Kyoya wonders how long she has endured isolation in the wasteland. He wonders if he could liberate her from her role as a demon king dedicated to destruction, potentially allowing her to live a normal human life. He questions whether he can spare her life and if they can be together. After spending 30,000 years in the wasteland, Felice reminds him that it's time, and he wonders if it's truly necessary. While they walk a bit, she lets him know that she's not entirely free from her roots, and her temporary self won't last much longer. Once consumed by her destructive drive, she'll start destroying everything, including him. He inquires what would happen if he doesn't mind if she ends his life. She responds by saying she wouldn't allow that, because in order to save the world, he must demonstrate the results of his training by defeating her. Then she asks if he's developed feelings for her, and he questions if he has. She shares that the 30,000 years spent with him have brought her great happiness. She mentions that anyone could have been chosen to end her, as it was a random summoning spell, but she's grateful that he was the one. With that, she takes flight into the air, and urges him to come and finish the battle. As Kyoya rushes towards her with the intent to attack, he suddenly notices a disturbing change in not just her eyes, but her overall appearance and demeanor. It dawns on him that this must be the destructive impulse controlling her, and she's no longer the Felice he once knew. In a swift move, Felice seizes his face and forcefully slams his head into the ground, causing Kyoya intense pain. However, the memory of the warm, not maniacal smile Felice used to wear gives him the resolve to keep fighting her. As their intense duel unfolds, he calls out her name, reminding her that she was the one who taught him everything even with the intent to kill her. But he poses a different question. What if he actually wishes for her to survive? She also gave him something he never had before. The joy of spending a long time with someone. As he charges in for one last attack, he explains that he has done everything she asked to fulfill her wishes. And for once, she should heed his words. Their clash unleashes a powerful energy blast. And when the dust settles, Kyoya emerges as the victor of their duel. He sits atop her, sword raised as if to strike her down. She pleads with him to finish her, as her death would break the contract that brought him here, allowing him to return to his world. She also asks for forgiveness for involving him. But then, Kyoya loses the will to end her life. He lets his sword drop to the ground and questions why she's apologizing, urging her to choose life. She inquires if he truly wants her to live on, even after causing harm to countless lives and 3,000 worlds. He exclaims that it's not her fault and wishes there was a way to separate her. She responds by saying if it were possible, she would have already tried, even with the Lavanquin. But Kyoya decides to take on the impossible task himself by activating the sigil to summon the Lavanquin. While doing so, he expresses his strong desire to break the chain binding her to her origin, allowing her to live as Felice instead of the Demon Lord. She pleads with him not to proceed because he isn't ready, and she, as the destroyer of worlds, couldn't do it either. She warns that if he fails, his soul will vanish. He reminds her that he just defeated her, and explains that in his world, the Demon Lord is supposed to share half of the world with anyone who helps them. As he demands half of everything, he successfully summons Lavanquin. When the sword touches the ground, it sends out a dark wave of energy that surrounds him, draining his life force. Inside this energy, he encounters the soul residing in Lavanquin, which appears as a mirrored version of himself. Lavanquin tries to talk him out of using the sword, reminding Kyoya of the many times he's given up on things, resulting in his boring drama-free life. It suggests giving up once more, but Kyoya, now resolute, refuses. He's determined not to abandon Felice. With all his remaining willpower and life force draining away, he approaches his mirrored self and grabs the sword. Striking at her spiritual core, a brilliant light surrounds him, causing him to lose consciousness. 
When he awakens, he finds a black cat on him, and his expression turns to shock as he realizes that the cat is none other than Felice. Even in her feline form, she can still communicate. He questions her about her unusual appearance, and she reveals that Lavenquin has shattered her powers into fragments, making it impossible to maintain her human form. She's lost her abilities and even her curse. Kyoya inquires if this means that he succeeded, but she disappoints him by explaining he's only halfway there. She adds that without her help in the end, both of them would have vanished from the world. Kyoya apologizes for his recklessness, but Felice stops him, expressing gratitude instead as she owes her life to him. She admits her confusion about what to do next without the binding root. Kyoya suggests that she come to his world, where he can introduce her to a normal life, and she happily agrees to his proposal. A few days later, Kyoya and Felice finally escape the lost world and find themselves in Japan. While they are out sightseeing, Felice expresses relief that they hitched a ride on the goddess's transfer gate, sparing them the hassle of building their own. Kyoya asks Felice where she would like to visit next, but before she can answer, three mysterious men suddenly materialize through a portal behind them. These men greet Kyoya and inquire if he's a returnee from another world. Nervously, Kyoya questions their identities, and they reveal themselves as part of the transferee's management committee. They hand him a letter, explaining that it's a summons from the Eugracia State Academy, and urge him to read it for more details. With the portal ready to take them away, they emphasize that Kyoya can't decline the summons, and then vanish through the portal, bringing us right back to where the story left off. In his dorm room, Kyoya apologizes to Fleece for not being able to give her a normal life as promised. She reassures him, saying that their life as is is way more exciting. Then Felice asks him about the power he's acquired, suggesting he could rule the school or even conquer the world. Kyoya responds, explaining that he's not interested in that. He mentions the consequence of wielding such power, and the need to stay low-key to avoid drawing attention. He decides to lead a peaceful life, and mentions that he's done enough fighting for a lifetime. Felice gives it her all to inspire him, emphasizing that in life, power isn't about being right or wrong, it's about how you wield it. She encourages him to have confidence in his abilities, and although he's hesitant, he eventually nods in agreement. Elsewhere in the academy, a goddess is thrilled about the impressive power shown by the students during the entrance ceremony. She eagerly anticipates supervising the students the next day. Kyoya's first night at Eugracia Academy ends, and he's ready to start a new day. Since the first day wasn't so promising or warm, he wonders what will happen on the second day of school. Regular classes will finally begin and teaching will commence. He wonders what kind of classes will be held for heroes at this kind of academy. This is thanks to the fact that he wasn't summoned by a goddess or used to being in the academy. And for him, being in the company of a demon lord and not just a demon lord but the destroyer of worlds, doing school life carelessly will be quite problematic. Kyoya's biggest problem is talking to others. He has spent most of his time talking to just Felice and her alone, as there was nobody he could talk to during his training. Felice hears Kyoya muttering something at the last minute and asks him what he's saying. He shows Felice the book he's reading and it turns out to be a guide to communicating with people. Kyoya boldly says that the book is his strategy for surviving in the school. With the goal to keep Felice hidden and secure, he needs to blend in at the school, so Kyoya plans to learn how to communicate and be open enough to make friends. For the past 30,000 years, he has talked to only her. Therefore, he has to refresh his communication skills with the other students of the school. Felice gets jealous and asks if their conversations and discussions are weird. Kyoya answers, yes, and lists instances where she constantly showed bad behavior. Sarcastically, he mentions Felice would tease him every chance she gets, as well as try to get him to drink despite him being a minor or even experiment with new magic on him. Then heal him right after, only to do it again. Felice admits to the accusations and holds her peace, jokingly responding to Kyoya and feigning ignorance, which makes him tick a little. Soon enough, they enter the classroom where his first actual lecture is to be held. Kyoya instructs Felice to stay in the bag and behave. He also adds that their discussion should be through telepathy. This way, nobody would spot or be freaked out about a talking cat. That is, if she is discovered. Out of the blue, a voice greets him as he opens the door to walk into the class. And he stares into an empty classroom with no one but himself. Kyoya is surprised that there's no one there. Felice points out that he's way too early, as the class starts by 8 and he's there by 7. The unknown voice speaks again, saying he's early, but Lala is first. Kyoya is shocked by the voice and leans over to see if there's anyone or anything there because the classroom seems empty. The owner of the voice is a little female, who Kyoya assumes is a lost child and asks her if she is one. This little female gets angry and agitated and bawls out at Kyoya, explaining that she isn't a lost child and that if she were, she would cry to him instantly. Most of the anger stems from the fact that everyone thinks she's a lost child at first, because she is tiny. 
Lala introduces herself as a goddess, which makes Kyoya shocked and worried for Felice's safety. He never thought he would encounter a goddess, and when Lala decides to prove to him that she's real, since she feels he doubts her, this makes him worry. But fortunately, Lala isn't a strong goddess and, compared to the others, actually relatively weak. Despite this, Kyoya still asks Felice and she confirms it. Kyoya apologizes, explaining that he has never seen a goddess before, which is the truth but an odd thing for a normal hero to say. Lala found this suspicious, and almost immediately Felice pointed out Kyoya's blunder to him, as goddesses summon heroes, so it would be strange for a hero to not have seen one. Felice asks him to fool her to evade suspicion. Kyoya smartly continues with flattery. He tells Lala that he has never seen a goddess as young and talented as she is before. It doesn't work though, as she still finds him suspicious and asks what he is hiding, adding that she smells something suspicious from the bag, which makes Kyoya panic. Luckily, when she gets a hold of his bag, she still doesn't get a hint of Felice being a demon lord. Lala is enveloped in the fluffiness and cuteness of the cat. After a long round of petting and them successfully fooling Lala, some of the classmates start walking in, and soon enough the classroom is filled with Kyoya's classmates. Kyoya is surprised that his classmates obediently came to school without coercion. This makes him wonder why, as he thought they would be more reluctant judging from the mood they had on the first day. He wonders if the executive officer's speech had an impact on them. Kyoya notices that it has been a while and no teacher has walked in. He asks Lala if she's the teacher, to which she answers no. She discloses that she is more important than a teacher, she is a superintendent. Kyoya wonders where the real teacher is, and as coincidence would have it, the executive officer walks right in introducing herself as their teacher. The whole class is shocked at the turn of events. And it's not just Kyoya who wears the shock on his face. The chief executive officer sarcastically asks why they've refused to greet their instructor. A student speaks up saying that they are just surprised that a fellow student would be their instructor. The chief executive officer asked them if they thought a regular school teacher would come to teach them. Everyone in the room is a hero, they all have some kind of power. There is no way a regular adult would control and teach them. She presses further by telling them that it's quite troubling that they feel on par with herself and Lala. The chief executive officer then says that she's supposed to start the class, but would love to get to know them first. For starters, she tests what the students are capable of. Using spatial magic, she moves the whole class to a space where the sky is stitched and the area is field-like. She advises them to try their best to not die. Kyoya analyzes his environment, and deduces that the space is created by advanced spatial magic. The fact that she could maintain the magic over a large space like this shows how advanced she is as their senior. Seeing this makes Kyoya understand why she doesn't want to be lumped in with them. Next up, she creates new monsters, stronger than the ones they had faced earlier. The goal is for the members of the class to survive by either defeating the monsters like the heroes they are, or just escaping death till they're all gone. Seeing that she has no intention of teaching them properly on the first try, Kyoya readies himself for battle, and reignites the fire he had for a fight, as it has been a while since he's done so. He draws his sword and sees the monsters as a good warm-up for his sluggish-feeling body, assuring Felice that he would take care of the monsters. The executive officer intends to use the beasts as a way of getting to know their abilities, rating and testing their skills as heroes, even though the students feel it's a terrible way to test them. Nonetheless, everyone gets to fighting and Kyoya's opponent turns out to be a Needle Dragon, which is an S-Class monster. Though Kyoya didn't know the habits of the Needle Dragon or even its name, after 30,000 years of fighting the Demon Lord Felice, he was pretty confident he could handle the monster. His dilemma now begins, as he must ensure he doesn't stand out to protect Felice. If he wins the fight too quickly, he would stand out to others as it would look unnatural. His classmates would probably ask what powers he used and how he is so strong. If he holds too much back, it would also draw attention and look unnatural. The onlookers would question if he's truly a hero and why he is so weak. Kyoya gets ready to attack the monster with the mindset that he has to win just right. After various exchanges with the dragon, blocking breath attacks and suppressing the fire magic, he successfully fakes his ability. Those watching marvel at the fact that he is facing a needle dragon, an S-class rank monster and holding his own against it. This meant that Kyoya was doing the acting just right. Soon enough, a classmate notices the horns of the dragon are short, meaning it's a female dragon. Female dragons are more weak and docile compared to male dragons. They now wonder if he is really a hero since he is evenly matched to a weak and docile creature. Kyoya knew what this meant, he was holding back too much. He decides to give the final blow and in one shot, uses his bare hands to end the dragon. This satisfied the curiosity of those watching, until a closer look is taken at the dragon and they discover it is a male one the strong kind. Amazed, they stare back at Kyoya in awe, and he has managed to draw the attention he didn't want. 
The classmates question how he's a dropout hero with such power at his disposal. How could a dropout hero in a single shot end in S-class male needle dragon? Kyoya knows he has to do something fast to sway their attention, so he pretends to have hurt his hand badly from the last move. The classmates buy the acting and feel that he is just acting tough and isn't really that strong. Finally, Kyoya is free of attention as he mutters to himself that this school life of acting is rough. Suddenly, a chaotic presence occurs that causes Kyoya to shudder. It is the presence of a Flame Wisp. The Flame Wisp is a shape-shifting pseudo-spirit and unlike demons, it is an artificial life form created by magic. Kyoya wonders why he was in the field, and if it is a part of the Chief Executive Officer Kuzuha's plan. Before anyone knew what was happening, the Wisp transformed into a Hydra-like dragon creature, and readies blasts of fire magic at the classmates. Everyone could see that this is a bad situation to be in. They are urged to deploy their defensive magic and Kyoya is already one step ahead. He successfully stops the explosion with his defensive magic. This new happening catches the eye of Goddess Lala, and she tries to tell Kuzuha to put an end to the test, but Kuzuha is fast asleep. Now it dawned on the students that the goddess and instructor had no intentions of stopping the calamity from occurring. The Wisp has incinerated the other monsters with the explosion. Kyoya doesn't have the patience to tolerate it anymore, so he decides to do something about the Wisp. He doesn't care who owned the pet or made it come to life and take that form. All he cares about is that he is going to put a stop to it. Using his eyes, he commands the Wisp to stay, like a dog. The beast feels Kyoya's intent and stops immediately out of fright. Kyoya asks his classmates to use their recovery magic while the Wisp has stopped. The mastermind behind the Wisp walks out into the open, asking if everything is over. The one responsible for this is Kishima Takeru, the dropout hero who challenged Kuzuha at the end of the welcoming ceremony. With a snap of the finger, Kishima Takeru commands the Wisp to go away, and it disappears into thin air. This confirms that he is the Flame Wisp's master. Kishima kept going on and on about how he can't take such a boring test seriously, as he is fueled with the impression that he is better than the rest. He's also cocky enough to ask them why they are so weak, and why they can't withstand the attack of the Flame Wisp. He even goes as far as to mock them for being scared of the Wisp and the damage it could do. He then calls them trash. Kyoya stands up to him, telling him that his insults are enough, and it should end there. Imari also shared Kyoya's thoughts, as she asked Kishima to apologize to everyone. She angrily asks him to apologize for being the reason everyone is hurting at the moment. Kyoya is shocked by her outburst, but Kishima, on the other hand, insults and intimidates her for being weak. He adds that they are all heroes and strength is justice for them. If she has a problem with him, she should make him apologize. He threatens to turn her into ashes, but she isn't moved, and agrees to make him apologize. Imari attacks him immediately to the shock of everyone including Kishima. Kishima uses defensive magic and recovery magic to heal himself. Kyoya advises Imari to back down, telling her that she doesn't stand a chance. Imari resolves to face Kishima and asks Kyoya to not stop her or interfere. This is her fight. She pulls out her sword and gets ready for a duel against the cocky Kishima. Kyoya worries for Imari's sake, as he wonders if she isn't more aggressive than expected. To him, it seemed like she was trying to push herself while facing Kishima. Felice calls out to Kyoya, asking him not to interfere. As the girl had said just that, it's Imari's fight. Kyoya agrees and stands down to watch. Meanwhile, Kishima went on, trash-talking and calling Imari an idiot who can't tell the difference in their abilities. He gives her a chance to back down on the fight, assuring her that he will curb stomp her and it would be boring. So in the most arrogant fashion ever, he asks her to attack first. Imari agrees and tries to use her unique skill granted to her by the goddess. Flower Bud of Heavenly Samjna, first stage. All the classmates are amazed by the unique skill, including Kishima, who is a bit terrified of it. Her skill is an exceptional skill among the so-called cheat abilities a transferee receives from a goddess. Unfortunately, she doesn't have the strength to use the skill, as she is not strong enough to fully unleash it. This erases Kishima's worries and makes him laugh at her inability to use even her own unique skill. Felice and Kyoya already realize how bad of a situation Imari is in. She is going past her limits and soon, Lala intervenes in the duel, asking Kishima to seize his actions and bullying the weak. Since Lala is a relatively weak goddess, Kishima asks her to shut up in a threatening manner. Lala has no choice but to stay away for her safety and go complain to Kyoya, whom she has taken a liking to. She asks Kyoya to do something about Kishima, the danger, and his scary appearance. Kyoya advises Lala to call quits on trying to interfere in the fight. Imari also adds that she doesn't want any interference in the fight still, despite the difference in their abilities and her now trembling body. 
Kishima makes fun of her trembling, scared self and asks her to quit the academy as she's not cut out for the school and is trash. At this point, Kyoya tries to intervene and broker peace between them. Since they all defeated the monsters, they can now return to normal lives in their abnormal situation at the academy. He tries to use the fact that they have all passed the test to resolve things, but Kishima sends him flying with a punch to the face. Kishima asks Kyoya to shut up as he's been talking, and he's getting Kishima pissed like he did the last time. Kishima asks Kyoya to show him his unique skill as well, boasting that he expects his to be trash too. Kyoya tells Kishima that he doesn't have one. This is because Kyoya wasn't summoned by a goddess, but a demon lord. Hearing this made Kishima laugh and insult even harder, calling Kyoya trash that he doesn't have an ability. Kishima picks up Kyoya's bag that has Felice inside, telling him that trash like Kyoya, who don't have any abilities, deserve to be incinerated. He decides to burn the bag as an example, but Kyoya seeing this in a second grabs Kishima's hand, crushing it and collecting the bag. Making Imari useful, Kyoya asks her to help him hold the bag, and asks Kishima to show him the so-called great ability he has been boasting of all the while. Kishima, pissed and conceited, decides to go all out with his strength by summoning his unique skill, Dvergur. This skill allows him to enhance the power of all the fire magic a hundred times. That means his fire output is increased by a hundredfold of his current output. Kishima promises to incinerate every last one of them. And from the looks of the skill, it's quite possible. Luckily, his opponent is Kyoya. And with just a whiff of magic, Kyoya deletes Kishima's unique skill, leaving nothing for him to fire at the class. Now all that's left is just an embarrassed Kishima, shouting fire with no action or consequence to back it. After a couple failed attempts, other classmates start to laugh at him. They also begin to wonder what Kyoya's unique ability is, since he said that he doesn't have one, but still managed to remove Kishima's spell. Kishima, however, doesn't give up. He assumes that the interfering is Kyoya's unique ability, and believes that he has figured Kyoya out. His deductions are not entirely wrong, as Kyoya did interfere with his unique skill. Where he is wrong is the fact that Kyoya's unique ability isn't interference. He does not have a unique skill, but has the ability to carry out any skill at the level of a unique skill. This means that whatever the skill is, Kyoya could unleash it at an advanced level of unique skill. A pretty nice skill if you ask me. Kishima decides that if magic would prove futile against Kyoya, then he'll batter Kyoya's body with his bare hands and brute force. In an attempt to save face, Kishima charges at Kyoya, who at this point decides it's time for some payback. He beats up Kishima in a hugely embarrassing way for humiliating him and Imani earlier, and trying to turn Felice into ashes. The beating was so fast that the other classmates couldn't see what was happening till Kyoya sent Kishima flying in the air. People start to stare and wonder how strong he actually is. To reduce the attention, he feigned pain in his leg, selling the story that Kishima ran into him when he lifted his leg, and then suddenly fell back on his own. This makes some of the classmates think he's just a lucky klutz. After all this, Kuzuha finally wakes up from her sleep, right in the middle of class. Everyone is so pissed at her, but she ignores them. Since no one died, she called the curtains on the first class, and advised those that are injured to head to the infirmary. The class gets transported from the conjured space to the real classroom. Kyoya wonders if she's really ending things like that, and what the point of the test was. Kuzuha walks up to Kyoya and tells him to show his unique abilities more. This means Kuzuha pretended to be sleeping and was really watching them all. Kyoya asks her what she means, but she doesn't reply and bids him farewell. Kyoya then realizes that even if it was all to save Felice, his actions were too excessive. And now, he's gotten attention and they're on to him. I guess you can say that simple school life is getting complicated. He soon realizes that the bag Felice was in is still with Imari, and as he turns to go get it, Imari stands in front of him, cupping his hands and asking to call him Master. Kyoya's school story is about to get extremely complicated. Lala is throwing a party to celebrate her newly formed team, which consists of her, Kyoya, Felice, and the girl from earlier who stood up to the arrogant hero Imari. The celebration is in full swing with food and drinks, and everyone seems to be into it, Everyone except Kyoya. He exasperatedly goes back in time to how he ended up in this pickle. Imari approached him asking that she address him as master. Seemed out of the blue. Until their instructor made them understand that there's a team list posted in the hallway and they should do well to check it out. The academy has a team system consisting of two to five members with one goddess in charge of each team. That's exactly how he ended up in a pickle. A team of overly excited girls where he's the only guy. Imari is excited to be on the same team with Kyoya, her master. 
and Lala is excited to be on the same team as Felice, aka Fluffy-chan. Imadi expresses how it must be fate to be on the same team with him, while Lala expresses Kyoya must be happy to be on a team she's leading. He decides they're alright, as long as they stop making a mess in his room with spilled drinks and chips. Imadi talks about being strong and knowing how to fight if she must beat Kishima. Kyoya waves her off by saying yesterday was just a fluke, and he messed up his spell by himself. She presses on, stating that she wants to be taught how to fight so she can be strong. Kyoya responds that there's nothing to teach her. Even if there is, that's the work of dear Lala, the lazy goddess. Lala retorts that the job of a goddess is to watch over the activities of the heroes. She herself is still an apprentice, so apparently she can sit back and eat chips. She goes on to say more confusing stuff like how the rest of the goddesses are too busy watching over the top team, and they don't have time to give lectures. Kyoya challenges she looks quite free at the moment, but Lala counters she's full right now and rather sleepy. Kyoya, ever exasperated, repeats he has nothing to offer Imari, and excuses himself to throw out the broken glass he's just cleaned up. Once he steps out, Felice questions what's holding him back from teaching the poor girl what she wants. She teases that being stingy won't make him popular with the ladies. Kyoya responds that he's just trying to stay out of trouble and not get exposed. He just wants to lay low and being a teacher is far from laying low. It's an antic that's begging for exposure. Felice expresses that she's grateful for all the sacrifices Kyoya has made on her behalf, but she also feels like he's overthinking things. It is not her wish for him to distance and isolate himself from his peers because he doesn't want to expose them. Getting involved with his peers can be risky, as they're bound to find stuff he's kept hidden. But on the bright side, association can be a wonderful experience. Even if he can't do it for himself, then what about her? Who actually looks forward to spending time with the other, bound to be chaos, team members. The next day, Kyoya is out quite early on a run. After which he would do some body exercises, then swinging practices, then a hundred times muscle training. Guess you could say it's hard to break a 30,000 year routine. Turns out Imari is also an early bird, practicing her swinging form which Kyoya notices and finds impressive. They fall into a conversation, with Kyoya asking her to tell him about the world she was summoned to. She states it was a beautiful world with a beautiful town and kind people. She concludes that she's glad the world was saved. A curious Kyoya asks how so, as he thought she was also a failed hero. She states she wasn't alone and was summoned with the rest of her class. They defeated the villain as a team. She wasn't strong enough to handle her power, so she was tasked with protecting the city. They were nice people, bringing her gifts, checking up on her, and offering assistance when she tried to manage her power. The whole experience made her want to be strong for at least the people she has grown to love so much. To protect them, the way they were able to protect her. Lately though, her zeal has been waning. She's scared of fighting. She trains, but when it comes to a real fight, it's like stage fright. She recalls how she just froze some days earlier with the rude hero and concludes maybe she's not cut out to be a hero. Kyoya pulls out a it's not what you can't do but can do line. She might have stage fright, but she's still courageous enough to face an opponent when she sees one. He recalls how she stepped out for everyone's sake against the bully. Him on the other hand only stepped out when he was being personally attacked. He tells her that she can conquer fear, and she needs to learn how to fight while trembling. He offers to help her with the basics of magic control, and she accepts. He would also appreciate if she stops referring to him as master as he considers them a team. Life at school kicks off. The class is split into two. There are the real heroes in one segment with unique abilities, and there are the failed heroes in the other who no one pays attention to, leaving them free to do whatever they want. Every day the failed heroes repeat the same basic training and lectures, and are not given any important tasks or missions as much isn't expected from them. It becomes a rather peaceful routine for them. Two weeks later, Lala brings in a letter from an important person from school addressed to Kyoya. It's a warning letter about dismissal from the academy if there's no improvement on the current situation of both Imari and Kyoya. They will be expelled from the school if they don't boost their SP level, which is currently negative 3000. SP, a point that increases by successful academic achievement or missions, and decreases by violation of school rules or failing a mission. In other words, it's a number that is vital to student life at school. Kyoya still doesn't understand why their SP level is at a large negative number but when he turns the back of the letter, he sees why. All negatives can be attributed to one careless action or another by Imari at some point. She bursts out crying in embarrassment, but Kyoya states that now is not a time for waterworks. They need to increase their SP level. Felice brings to their knowledge a Demon King subjugation expedition mission. Meanwhile, Kyogoku is informed that he will be going to the same mission with B11, that's Kyoya's team. Kyogoku considers them failures and trash, and he won't hesitate to deal with them if they get in his way. 
It's now the day of the Demon King Subjugation Expedition mission. Kyoya and his team are on their way to the meeting in a plaza. Imari excitedly talks about her hearing the operation would be a joint one with a senior group. She expresses her eagerness to meet them and see firsthand how awesome they are. Kyoya rolls his eyes. It's Imari's carelessness that has them having to take the mission in the first place. Lala states that this is her first expedition and she looks forward to experiencing the fun adventure with Felice, who she's gotten rather attached to. Kyogoku reprimands them for being late. They are 15 minutes late and he's not happy about it. Kyoya apologizes and tries to clarify if Kyogoku and the other guys with him are the seniors they've been told to meet. Kyogoku introduces himself as the leader of the A25 team. Kyogoku then asks if they are aware of what their job is as a B team. Imari raises her hand to answer, saying it must be to defeat the demon lord like the heroes they are and bring peace to the world. Kyogoku clarifies that their job is to stay out of the way. They are merely present to provide support. The mission is a stage 3 and just the A-team would be enough to complete it. Kyoya doesn't know what is meant by stage, so he's lectured. Stage. A classification of different levels of threat to the other world. There are 9 stages depending on their danger. Stage 1 has no monsters, whereas stage 9 is where the threat level is of an invasion. Stage 3 can be cleared by just a single group. There is also an exception to the stages of the Lost World, that is said to exceed stage 9. Kyoya pushes that if the mission can be cleared by the hero alone, then why was it made a joint one? The guy who has been lecturing Kyoya jumps in to explain once again, but is suddenly jumped by Kyogoku, who smacks him for giving the B-team a lecture in the first place without permission. Kyogoku sneers about his judgement that the B-team didn't need an explanation or a busybody to help. The guy whose face is being held to the ground by Kyogoku's brute force excuses that they are new and he felt a little guidance wouldn't hurt. Imari scolds Kyogoku for his violent approach and he lets go of the poor lad. He states that the mission is a joint operation because of the SP. A bonus SP will be given for training the newcomers. The A team needs the bonus SP but not the help of the B team. All the B team needs to do is stay out of the way so the A team won't be slowed down. In return, the B team gets their own share of SP without fuss, it's a win-win situation. The hostility between both teams is, however, evidently present. So obvious, in fact, that a goddess swooped in, noticed it, and warns them about fighting, which is prohibited. She is Lady Freyfeshia, the goddess of the A-team. Kyoya notices she's beautiful. Kyogoku tries to play things cool like there's no beef to begin with. Lady Freyfeshia reminds Kyogoku that they are now all on the same team, so no one should be treated as an outsider. Lady Freyfeshia has also come bearing good news that there's a promotion in waiting for Kyogoku when the mission is complete. He will be promoted to a B rank. She goes on to say that she's proud to be his handler and he coolly vows to do his utmost to honor her. She then turns to address the B11 team, apologizing for being late. Introductions are made and Lala notices how flustered both Kyoya and Imari are in Lady Freyfeshia's presence. It's quite a different experience from when they first met Lala, who is also a goddess. Even Felice feels a certain way. She feels she's several times more beautiful, for Kyoya to be flustered by someone else. With a throw of Lady Freyfeshia's staff, the doors to the other world open. Kyoya gives Imari a reassuring pat. With Freyfeshia leading, the others follow through the transfer gate and appear in somewhere called Romless. Domres, the king, is there to personally welcome them. He expresses his gratitude for their acceptance of the mission. In their wake, he prepared a small feast to celebrate their arrival and asks them to enjoy themselves. Both Lala and Imari gush about how great the food is and ask for extra servings. Kyoya is lost in thought, however, about how picturesque this world they've been transported to is. It is also quite different from the lost world. Kyogoku tells his majesty that they don't have the luxury of time on their hands, and he would rather they go straight to business. The Romless army finds itself drained and weary, having fought numerous exhausting battles against the relentless demon army. To make matters worse, the constant need for resupplies and the strain on military expenses led to heavy taxes burdening the already struggling citizens. As if that weren't enough, marauding monsters ravage crops and contaminate the soil, rendering the once fertile land barren. This chain of events cascades into food shortages that initially plague the countryside, prompting an exodus of people fleeing to the capital in search of sanctuary. With citizens in the capital grappling with mounting stress from various fronts, the public order begins to deteriorate, adding another layer of concern to the already dire situation. Amidst this mounting crisis, it feels that there's no end to their problems, and ultimately, their entire world teeters on the brink of destruction, threatened by the looming shadow of the Demon Lord. Kyogoku states that he already has a clear picture of the situation. What he needs is where he can find the Demon Lord Gigjorg. Kyogoku goes on to say that he won't be needing troops. The troops should be instead used to defend the capital and rebuild the city. 
Someone from the king's cabinet counters that they plan to form an elite force to assist the heroes. Kogoku counters back that all they will be is a burden. All he needs is the Demon Lord's location and the problem will be solved. Kyogoku then assigns the B team to be on defending duty as well. They will remain in the castle while the A team will invade the Demon Lord. With that, the A team takes their leave. A maid shows the B team to their living quarters. Lala calls dibs on the soft sofa declaring her need to take a nap after the hefty feast that left her full. Imadi is pumped about their mission to defend the capital, calling it a big responsibility. Kyoya reminds her that she wanted to be able to properly defend by properly fighting. She admits that she would like to defeat the Demon Lord with her bare hands, but the most important thing is to protect everyone in this world, even if it's behind the scenes. While they're conversing, someone flies over the balcony and questions if they're the heroes from the other world. Without waiting for a response, the stranger asks for a fight. Imadi pulls out her blade and asks Kyoya to stand back. She launches an attack at the intruder, but the intruder swiftly dodges and lays one of their own that has Imadi flat on her back. The intruder notes Imadi is rather weak, but before they can process anything else, Kyoya steps in and has the intruder in an arm lock, with which he uses to push them to the ground so they are restricted. The intruder notes Kyoya is fast. He asks the intruder, who is female, not to move. According to Kyoya's assessment, Imadi appears to be mostly okay, although a bit dazed from the encounter. The intruder's choice to use the back of her sword to subdue Imadi is an interesting detail. It suggests that there was no intent to kill. This leaves a big question mark hanging in the air. What could the intruder possibly want? Kyoya and the intruder take the time to help Imadi onto the sofa and start a discussion. The intruder is understandably curious about Kyoya's identity, wondering if he might be the local hero who bravely plans to take on the Demon Lord all by himself. She couldn't help but notice that his actions earlier didn't quite fit the mold of ordinary heroics. She takes off her hood and introduces herself as Anri. She talks about a prophecy from a goddess proclaiming the arrival of a true hero from another world into theirs. She presses on to know if the goddess was talking about them. Kyoya says on the assumption it is them, why did she attack? She clarifies she did so to confirm whether or not they are to be trusted with protecting her world. There are a lot of people in this world that she cares about, so if Kyoya and his team can indeed save them all, then she's indebted. On the other hand, if they aren't the real deal, she isn't afraid to teach them a lesson or two. Anri assesses that Imadi aside, Kyoya seems capable of the task. But even so, she doesn't believe he's strong enough to defeat the Demon Lord. She warns if he's weak, then he won't stand a chance. Gigjorg is brutal and cunning and will come at his opponent with every trick in the book. Kyoya gathers Anri wasn't strong enough to take Gigjorg down. She concedes it was pathetic. In the end, she was no protector, just a failed hero herself. Gigjorg took her parents and the whole village. To avenge them, she picked up a sword. At the end, she never could become strong enough. Every battle she has fought, she has always barely won. The fact that she's alive is nothing short of a miracle. The first time she sought to fight the Demon Lord, she couldn't even reach him. She managed to escape alive and sunk into a depression, being reminded that she wasn't strong enough. The weight of her past experiences suddenly hits her, and she had a revelation. She's not a hero, not brave, and definitely not strong. Instead, she felt like a weak, defeated soul yearning for revenge. With a sincere tone, she apologizes for the somewhat gloomy reflection, but adds that the lesson here is crucial. She stresses the importance of never underestimating Gigjorg, regardless of how confident one might feel going into a confrontation. Kyoya tries to ease Anri's concerns, assuring her that there's no need to worry. His team serves as a backup, but the real heavy hitters, the elite of the heroes, are taking on Gigjorg. With their skills and experience, Kyoya is confident that they'll bring justice to Anri and ensure her vengeance is fulfilled. Anri, upon hearing this, lets out a sigh of relief, appreciating the assurance that her quest for retribution is in capable hands. Anri continues to reiterate her wish to see the Demon Lord defeated. What's better is if she could do it with her own hands. Imadi signifies she's awake and shares her similar experience of feeling weak and powerless. Imadi tells Anri that regardless of her strength, she will continue wielding her sword. This is to encourage Anri to do the same. It may not be for revenge, but one day someone would need protection only they can offer. The heartfelt exchange turns into teasing and then introductions from both girls. Anri apologizes to Imadi for hurting her earlier and teases her about training more. Felice calls out to Kyoya, expressing she has a bad feeling. There's a ripple of magic in the air. The knight signals bad omens, so she asks Kyoya to be on guard. After all, he's the esteemed hero entrusted to protect the castle. Kyoya looks back at Anri and Imadi, and wonders why heroes from another world were summoned when Anri seems to care deeply enough to protect her own. He asks why the goddesses can't give the powers needed to the local heroes. 
Felice replies that if it were in the goddess's powers, they would. When all else fails, they resort to people of the earth for help. People of the earth were originally created to be warriors of great power. By unbinding one's shackles through the key that is the goddess, one would become the great warrior they were destined to be. If humans had unrestricted access to their powers, they would destroy themselves. History has proven that humans with power will repeatedly fight each other. This is why the goddess who oversees the world tree decided to place shackles on the people of the earth. Kyoya analyzes that if it's the case, then the academy is run by both the goddesses and humans. Felice gives an affirmative, stating it's dangerous. Kyoya can't help but wonder what the goddesses were planning when they decided to break the taboo. Suddenly, what looks like a carnival tent materializes before them. And it's so unexpected that both Imadi and Anri rush out to investigate. Kyoya, understandably concerned, turns to Anri, and inquires if she has any idea what's happening. Anri nods with a hint of recognition, indicating that she's not entirely in the dark about the situation. As they stand outside, a mysterious voice echoes through the castle, addressing the residents and playfully announcing its arrival. It's a voice that sends shivers down their spines, an eerie presence declaring its intention to have some fun. And then, in a dramatic and spine-tingling moment, a colossal clown figure materializes before Kyoya and the group, its face resembling a menacing skull. It's a startling revelation. Gigjorg has arrived. Anri steps up angrily, and questions Gigjorg's audacity to show his face in front of her. She bravely asks what the Demon Lord is doing there. Gigjorg replies by teasing her, saying that he's here to see her. According to Gigjorg, Anri killed his four heavenly kings, so this must have annoyed him and made him come for revenge. Gigjorg expresses his displeasure at Anri's act, sarcastically asking her if she knows what it feels like to lose someone close to her. Of course she does, Gigjorg, you killed her parents, didn't you? The Demon Lord's taunts are clearly working, and Anri nearly loses her mind and tries to confront him. Fortunately for her, Kyoya calms her nerves, reminding her that the Demon Lord is as crafty as he is strong, and that she mustn't fall for his cheap tricks. Kyoya also wonders if Gigjorg is truly there alone. Just as they're talking, they hear battle commands from behind. It looks like the soldiers have arrived to take down the Demon Lord, or at least try to. The soldiers bring a special magic cannon along and take aim. Their aim is good, and the magic cannon goes directly to Gigjorg, landing what should have been a significant hit on the Demon Lord. The locals start to rejoice at the defeat of Gigjorg, but Anri is far from convinced that the Demon Lord is truly gone, saying that he can't go down so easily. Just as she says, Gigjorg resurfaces after a little while, mocking the futile efforts of the soldiers and their weapon. This time, Gigjorg commands some demons to attack the soldiers and everyone else. It's an entire army of demons, and it's not looking good for the soldiers and the people. Kyoya figures that the giant Demon Lord in the sky is not Gigjorg. It's simply a dummy which is made by magic. At the moment, the real Gigjorg could be anywhere. Kyoya decides to join the fight against Gigjorg's demons, as it is hardly a time for one to stay in hiding. But just as Kyoya braces himself for the fight, Anri calls his attention to some people at the top of a building. It's Kyogoku Arata and his three companions, the A-Team. It looks like they're here to finally save the day. Kyogoku orders his companions to do the usual, so they start passing their magic to him. Gift Nova, Bloom of the Heavenly Blessing, and Lyrion Serenade. Kyogoku's teammates strengthen him with what Kyoya concludes is either enhancement magic or unique abilities. The demons approach a shimmering Kyogoku to attack him, but he activates air raids, which easily wipes out the entire demon army in a single strike. Everyone is amazed at Kyogoku's ability, and Kyoya is also impressed by the skill. At this point, the demon lord comes out, while he predicted that his demons wouldn't be enough to destroy the heroes, he never expected them to get wiped out so easily. The giant body in the sky is no longer present, and what everyone sees now is Gigjorg's true, normal-sized body. The Demon Lord reveals that he's at that exact location because he felt a strong magical presence that piqued his curiosity. Kyogoku replies that Gigjorg made a silly mistake by coming there, despite knowing that such a strong magical presence is there. Gigjorg, who seems to take the sarcastic route for most of his words, compares the presence of the heroes to a kid getting a new toy. According to the Demon Lord, he wants to crush the new heroes right in front of the people, so he can look at their faces as he takes away their new toys. Okay, this guy is a psychopath. Gigjorg starts releasing his magical energy, which is intimidating to everyone around. The Demon Lord claims that the move was originally intended for Anri, but he's more than happy to deal with her after facing the heroes. Gigjorg sends his magic energy attack straight at Kyogoku, but it looks like the hero has come prepared. He activates the Volodja Vervelo skill and throws it at Gigjorg's energy balls. 
After going at each other for a long time, both moves are neutralized, and Kyogoku comes out unhurt. Gigjorg is surprised that his move was practically rendered useless by the heroes. He's lost in his surprise, so he doesn't see Kyogoku sneaking up on him from behind. The hero is extremely fast, and completely catches the Demon Lord off guard. Kyogoku takes out Gigjorg's arm with his weapon, and then proceeds to land hits on Gigjorg in different places. Gigjorg is powerless to stop Kyogoku's moves, and he's stunned because the scenario playing out is completely different from what he must have had in his head. Kyogoku ends the battle in style, finishing off the Demon Lord in front of everyone else. Kyoya analyzes the battle, and understands that Kyogoku became so strong by taking advantage of the three-man enhancement magic. Kyogoku has just given Kyoya a lesson on how a real team operates. Unfortunately, Kyogoku is not a man who likes to keep his mouth in check. He rudely calls out Kyoya, saying that the battle should be a lesson on the difference between true heroes and losers, like Kyoya and his companions. With that being said, he immediately calls his team and leaves. Anri is left stunned by Kyogoku's strength. She could hardly lay a finger on the Demon King, and yet here stood the man who defeated him in almost an instant. The people of the city rejoice once more as they have finally overcome the Demon King. Or have they? Just as Kyogoku Arata is about to leave, Komari points out the teleportation circle that just opened. It's Gigjorg again, and the Demon Lord doesn't look very happy. Gigjorg swears to never forgive Kyogoku for what he just did. The celebration of the people is once again short-lived, as the Demon Lord simply refuses to die. The Demon Lord is more of a talking head at this stage, and he complains bitterly about what he's had to suffer at the hands of Kyogoku, promising to never forgive him. He has no problems with motion, as his cut-off hand picks up his large head and moves into the teleportation circle. While some of the people lose their confidence after witnessing what just happened, a large number of them, including Kyogoku, remain confident. In the warrior's eyes, it wouldn't make much of a difference if the Demon Lord ran away a thousand times. They already know his strength by gauging it during the battle. Kyogoku said that Gigjorg's strength is only stage 3, which shouldn't be a problem for them to handle whenever they're ready. Anri calls them out for their complacency, reminding them not to use this battle as a measure of Gigjorg's strength. Who knows whether or not the Demon Lord is hiding some power yet to be revealed. Kyogoku replies sharply and rudely, questioning why he's supposed to take advice from amateurs like Anri. Once again, he points out the difference between a professional team and Kyoya's. Everyone around starts hailing Kyogoku for his good work, so Anri is forced to join the praises of the crowd. The entire city is in a festive mood tonight, celebrating the defeat of the Demon Lord. Gigjorg may still be alive, but the last battle with Kyogoku and his companions have given the people a renewed sense of hope. Unlike in the past, they now believe that the Demon Lord has a weakness and can be defeated. There's food, drinks, peace celebration flags and whatnot, as all the people make merry. Kyoya and his companions remain indoors and watch the celebrations from a distance. Lala is drawn to the fun celebration and wishes to join the people, but Kyoya strongly advises against it. Lala is a goddess and cannot be seen amongst the people at the moment. That might cause bigger problems than solutions. Lala proves stubborn and insists on attending the festival, so Komari has to tempt her with a counteroffer of chips, soda, and pudding in exchange for staying put. Lala immediately agrees to the deal as she can't resist the offer. It's not just Lala, Felice is also tempted by the idea of going to the festival. Again, Kyoya does not entertain that idea. Their new friend, Anri, isn't in such a good mood. Anri is still brooding over the events of that night, as she doesn't believe how easily the Demon Lord was taken down. Kyoya believes that Anri might need their companionship, so he urges his friends to stay with her and offer support. Just then, someone knocks at the door, although they're not expecting visitors at this hour. Curiosity leads them to open the door, and it turns out that the person at the door is Shindo Yuki, a member of Team A. Yuki introduces himself as the support guy from Team A, and he asks for a minute to talk with Kyoya and his companions. The first thing Yuki does is apologize for every terrible thing Kyogoku must have done earlier on, including the way he rudely addressed them. Yuki insists that his team leader isn't a bad person, but just has a very pragmatic method and minimizes interaction. This leads to Kyogoku coming off as rude sometimes. He might not have heard the full conversation, but Yuki is pretty sure that his team leader must have said something either hurtful or rude or maybe both. Next, Yuki specifically addresses Anri. According to him, King Damaris has told them a thing or two about Anri, and how she has risked everything to protect the city for a while now. He apologizes that he, along with the other outsider heroes, have taken credit for saving the city, when it should be Anri who deserves the praise. Anri insists that she's okay with it, as all she's ever done is try to protect others. Komari confesses that she previously thought everyone from Team A was a scary person, but Yuki doesn't seem to fit that description. Yuki chuckles and says that characters are different for each hero, 
He also says that even though they're all called heroes, each one of them has different strengths and different backgrounds. As for Yuki, he says that he's ranked F, the lowest class. He shows his mark and says that he's just lucky to be given that mark. Yuki insists that below the surface, he's not so different from the dropout heroes like Kyoya. He narrates his story prior to being called to the Academy, saying how powerless he was against the Demon Lord back in his original world. According to Yuki, while he cursed himself for being so weak on a fateful day, the heroes from the Academy appeared. Yuki joined them in defeating the Demon Lord in that world, which earned him the mark he carries today. But Yuki insists that he barely did anything in the battle. He simply piggybacked on the efforts of others. Deep down, Yuki thinks of himself as a fake hero, which is why he completely understands what the likes of Anri are going through. Yuki addresses Anri, reminding her that she's been the one fighting the Demon Lord and defending the kingdom until the heroes came in. She deserves as much credit as any hero out there. Yuki gets up to leave, leaving the others surprised at his sudden departure. He explains that his team is about to leave to finish off the Demon Lord. According to Yuki, Kyogoku wants to get it done quickly, so he expects everything to be over by morning. The others wish him good luck, and for once, Anri feels safe leaving the Demon Lord's battle in the hands of other people. When he leaves, Kyoya talks about how he has a nice attitude. He says that if all heroes were like Yuki, then associating with the heroes wouldn't be a problem. Felice doesn't agree so much, as she says that Anri is a little too nice, and lacks that sense of arrogance. According to Felice, the nice guys are always put down first. At this point, all they can hope for is the city's true heroes to succeed in their mission. As Yuki said, it should all be over by morning. The morning comes a little too quickly, and the city bells are already ringing. Kyoya and his companions go out into the city, which is filled with people who are eager to see the results of the battle against the Demon Lord. While some people are anxious, others are already celebrating, as they have full faith in Timei's ability to take down the Demon Lord. The city is filled with different people and different characters. One man touches Lala's goddess wings, asking if she's a little girl playing dress up as a goddess. This infuriates Lala and she knocks the man out cleanly. Amidst all the distractions, Komani points out that the heroes are yet to show up, even though it's already 10 o'clock. It's almost like they were waiting for her to talk, because just at that moment a teleportation circle opens up. The heroes come out of the circle, but not in the way the people expect them to. They're all sprawled across the ground, lying unconscious. The mood in the city goes from excitement, to anxiety, and then to utter fear. Kyoya makes his way through the crowd and goes to meet the fallen heroes, trying to see if any one of them is still alive. Luckily, the heroes are still clinging on to life, but just barely. Kyoya instructs Komari to carry out first aid practices and tells Anri to get the guards and medics immediately. Just then, Yuki manages to open his eyes and see Kyoya. He can barely talk, but he apologizes to Kyoya saying his team has failed against Gigjorg, the Demon Lord. The fallen heroes from Team A have now been taken into medical care. Although they have yet to wake up, the head surgeon insists that their lives are not in danger, even though they've been stripped of their roots. The root of a person is the soul itself. According to the doctor, Yuki is the only person whose roots barely survived. Without these roots, however much the external wounds heal, one can never regain consciousness. Yuki might have his roots, but he's also badly injured, and it might take a while before he can talk again. Compared to how easily they overcame the Demon Lord the first time, it's scary to think how badly a defeat they've suffered now. Kyoya thinks about what kind of force is powerful enough to take away one's roots. He also wonders if the Demon Lord is truly the one who took the roots away. From their previous battle, it's clear that the Demon Lord is barely strong enough to defeat Team A, let alone strip people of their roots. This leads Kyoya to conclude that there's an even more powerful force behind Gigjorg. Kyoya asks Lala if they can still expect some form of help from the Academy, but Lala admits that she's not strong enough to open a gate by herself, unless Lady Freyfeshia wakes up. Anri gets up unexpectedly and reaches for her sword. The others are surprised and question her actions. From her countenance, it's clear that Anri has had enough of the Demon Lord, and wants to end things. She confirms the suspicion, as she says she needs to fulfill her duty as a hero. The only hope the people had, the heroes from another world, have been so easily defeated. Anri cannot sit and watch her people suffer from anxiety, so she must do something. Komari insists that Anri should stay put, and Kyoya agrees with Komari. Kyoya says that now that the people are anxious, they must see Anri as the last straw of hope. This means that Anri must not make any rash decisions, including running off to face Gigjorg alone. Anri's departure from the city would only make everyone more anxious and do more harm than good. Kyoya says that the Academy should notice that something is wrong soon, and they should send reinforcements. Until then, they must all remain calm. In the end, they manage to convince Anri to not make any rash decisions. However, she doesn't want to stay put, 
as she insists on going to check on the city. The others aren't so comfortable with letting her go by herself, so Komadi offers to go with her. Right before she leaves, Koya takes off his silver ring and gives it to Komadi as a good luck charm. Komadi completely misreads the signs, and all she can think about as she runs off is how a man just gave her a ring. Koya comes back and sits down on the sofa. Lala takes a sleeping position with her head resting on Koya's lap. She insists that she doesn't want to sleep anywhere else as she's completely tired. Koya lets the goddess stay until she falls asleep. Now, Koya and Felice are the only conscious ones remaining in the room. Felice asks what Koya has in mind to do about the situation. Koya says that it's the same as before, as he intends to wait. Felice doesn't buy it, as she feels that Koya has something else on his mind. Koya insists that there's truly nothing else on his mind. He then leaves the room to get some dinner and rest afterwards, as he's on patrol duty that night. That night, Koya walks through the city and sees everyone in a state of despair and confusion. The state of the entire city prompts Koya to decide whether to truly wait or to do something about it. We both know what he's choosing. Koya opens a teleportation circle that leads him to a familiar terrain. He remembers that he's not been in that area for a long time, but he's only there to pick up something and immediately be on his way. It's a special sword that proves very difficult to lift. Even after using all of his strength, it takes a while for Koya to pull the sword out of the place it's kept in. He finally does it and goes back to the city through the teleportation circle. Surprisingly, he meets Felice, who has taken a human form, waiting for him just outside of the circle. Felice sarcastically asks whether he no longer intends to wait for the academy anymore. Koya asks if Felice intends to stop him, but the cat doesn't give a direct answer. Felice admits that Koya is doing something that should be stopped, but there's no way to stop Koya in this current form. Felice even teases by threatening to cry and beg Koya to stay put. In the end, they agree that Koya has to do what he has in mind, but Felice also warns Koya to be very careful and return as quickly as possible. The next teleportation circle Koya opens leads directly to the Demon Lord's castle. There's no chance to sneak into the castle, and he must go in directly. The Demon Lord's army has already spotted Kyoya, and they blow the trumpet to announce his arrival. Inside the castle, the Demon Lord talks with someone, saying that they have another arrival. Gigjorg is surprised that the latest arrival is on his own. He notes that he's never seen someone so reckless since Anri. The Demon Lord commands that his army prepare the finest welcome for the incoming challenger. Is Kyoya truly prepared for what's coming? Is the Demon Lord even remotely aware of what's coming at him?